Okay, well, it's 6.02. We've got a good number in. I think people will probably stay, keep coming in, but um, I think it might also be time to start. So thank you so much to everyone who is joining us tonight. I'm Kate Thwaites, um, Federal Member for Jagger Jagger. Even though I can't see you, I'm sure I have spoken to a lot of you before. And of course, tonight I'm joined by Chris Bowen. I'm going to start by acknowledging that uh, for most of us, we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm really so pleased that um, all of you have been able to join us tonight. I'll start with the housekeeping. I know you're all pretty familiar with how it works, uh, but obviously uh, we will um, start with a, an opening from me and from Chris. Uh, and then we'll go to questions and please put your questions in the Q&A box and I'll go through them and read out as many as I can to Chris. Don't use the chat box uh, for your questions. It's hard to work across the two. Make sure you put your questions in the Q&A box, please. Uh, I am so pleased to be holding this event tonight with Chris, not only uh, because um, it's wonderful to have Chris um, virtually in Jagga Jagga. We haven't had the opportunity to have him physically here this term, so it's really great to be able to have him virtually here, um, but also because I think this is the most important topic that we are dealing with as a country, uh, as an electorate at the moment. And I know that sounds big when we're dealing with COVID as well, but I would say that for tonight, we had around 160 RSVPs, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of you, just like me, are feeling quite a bit over Zoom and yet you've all chosen to join us at six o'clock tonight for another Zoom session. And what that says to me, uh, as all your correspondence and phone calls and the chats that we have when we can see each other face-to-face -face says to me, is that you know that this issue is so important. You want more action on it. And certainly that's something that every time I'm talking with Chris or I'm in the parliament in Canberra, that's my message. The people in Jagger Jagger want more action on climate change and it is really good to have Chris with us tonight because Chris obviously brings for us the value of his time uh, in economic portfolios before he took on the climate portfolio. And I think what that means is Chris really discusses this in terms of the potential that is there, the massive trans transformation that has to happen for our economy, but the potential that is there for the new jobs, the new industries uh, that we should get and not get left behind on, which of course is where we currently are at risk of. And we've seen that play out again this week uh, with the Nationals saying absolutely no way, no commitment to net zero uh, and preventing Australia from really doing what we absolutely just need to get on with doing. So with that preamble, I will throw over to Chris uh, and then, as I said, we'll take questions after. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Kate, and thanks for the invitation to join you tonight. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the fact that I'm speaking to you from my home, which is the land of the Gabriel people of the Darug Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and thank them for their stewardship of what we now call Southwestern Sydney over many millennia and thank all Indigenous people for their stewardship of our lands. Um, and thank Kate for uh, setting tonight up. We had talked occasionally about uh, me coming to Jagger Jagger for some sort of in-person forum, but the the uh, situation has been against us. It's um, uh, pretty much uh, difficult for me to leave my LGA at the moment. I mean, I represent the epicenter hotspot of uh, Sydney, which uh, means I've had plenty to do with in Southwest Sydney, but also makes obviously coming to Victoria impossible. But I will be there in person at some stage. And uh, Kate was very keen to do uh, tonight's event. And she is, in her relatively short time in Parliament, made a huge impact uh, on many progressive issues, but none, none more so than climate change. Uh, she is, as she said, she's very, a very regular interlocutor with me uh, on phone and by text message uh, in the caucus, uh, very strong advocate of strong action on climate change and a very, very powerful voice for the people of Jagger Jagger. And she's made a strong mark, as I said, in a relatively short period of time. Don't mistake her soft-spokenness for a lack of determination. Uh, she uh, goes about it in a polite way, but, uh, but uh, has a very, very strong uh, sense of uh, social justice and climate justice, which is very welcome. Look, uh, I thought I'd speak for a few minutes just to get the conversation going and then look forward to having plenty of questions. Although I should tell you, as I said, I'm talking to you from my house and we're expecting a very big thunderstorm over any minute. So that might mean, I hope it doesn't make any impact on connectivity. Um, and it might mean you hear the odd crash. It's not one of my teenagers throwing things around, although that is also distinctly possible. It is uh, more likely thunder. 
Um, but uh, just to get the conversation going, obviously, as you said, Kate, this is a key period for the planet and for our country. There's coming weeks and months uh, in the lead up to COP. And uh, really, uh, quite rightly, the asset is on Australia to do much, much more. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I think we can win the climate debate in Australia and the change in focus that we have engaged in and will continue to engage in. So obviously uh, we enter COP, and, uh, which is a, a key moment, the, uh, the, the most key moment for the world since Paris and arguably since Copenhagen to ensure that we are doing our best to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees, uh, which is after all the entire you know, modus operandi, the entire rationale for this Glasgow summit. And that's what the government, I think, you know, either doesn't understand or doesn't uh, want to understand, that this is all about actually nations of the world reporting on what more they will do uh, since Paris. And uh, this is just not the approach that our government's taking and our government is really one out uh, in the lead up to COP. We, have, we are more isolated on this issue on climate change than we have ever been on any issue in our history from our friends and allies. Um, you know, I've thought about this a lot and tried to think of examples of where Australia was more isolated, more one out than we are in the lead up to the Glasgow summit than this government is on our behalf as a country uh, on climate change. And there isn't one. Uh, I can't think of a single issue, uh, which is deeply disappointing. And a few weeks ago, I gave a speech. I don't normally recommend people read my speeches, but if you are interested in reading further about Labor's approach to climate change, I gave a speech at the Better Futures Forum um, uh, in which I outlined four principles of Labor's approach uh, to climate change, which I'll just talk about briefly because it is really uh, relevant in the lead up to, to uh, the Glasgow meeting. Firstly, that the country must commit to net zero by 2050 and a Labor government will and will legislate for net zero by, by 2050. But secondly, and importantly, that is not enough. You know, some people say, uh, net zero by 2050 is too late, which it is if that's all you do. Um, the key is not what happens in 2050. The key is getting to net zero uh, by 2050 as quickly as possible, by which I mean it's the sum total of emissions between now and 2050 which determines the degree of climate change. So hence a very strong roadmap to net zero is very, is very uh, important. Um, and so we've called on the government to go to Glasgow with better and stronger targets in the medium term. Uh, 2030, 2035, we need to do much better than the 26 to 28 percent, which is currently Australia's target. Um, after all, that is Tony Abbott's target. But we've changed prime ministers a few times, but we still have the same targets that Tony Abbott gave Australia, which ultimately, with respect to Tony Abbott, it was and is a climate change denier. Uh, so we have the targets given to the country by somebody who didn't believe in the science of climate change, of human induced climate change. And that's just not good enough. And I know we have the debate at the moment about whether the government will commit to net zero by 2050 or not. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, who knows? We'll see. But that's just a ridiculous argument. It should be, it should be the bare minimum. It should be the minimum bipartisan consensus that net zero by 2050 is the, is the national aim. And to get to net zero by 2050, they're going to need to do much more than 26 to 28% over the medium term. And I've indicated that if the government doesn't increase the targets at Glasgow, then you know, as the alternative government, I'll be outlining a much stronger roadmap to 2050 that a Labor government will bring. We want to give the government the chance to do it at, at uh, Glasgow. Unfortunately, I don't represent Australia at Glasgow, but we play no role, Kate and I, as much as we would like that that was different. Um, we are simply um, the alternative government and we have no role in setting the current targets at Glasgow. But if the government doesn't increase the targets, then I will outline a much stronger roadmap to net zero. The second and uh, principle is that good uh, is that that must be accompanied by policies. We've already started to outline our policies, but my point is that a target in and of itself, as important, has to be the framework for the policies that come underneath it. That simply having the target isn't enough. Now the government says, "Oh, you can't have a target without policies," and I agree with that. But they use it as an alibi not to have either. Uh, I use it as a spur to do both. That we have to do both. And um, we've already started outlining some. In fact, we've outlined and announced more climate change policy this year, this calendar year, than we have any other portfolio. Um, starting, I took over the job in January and we've made four or five very significant announcements since January. They build on the announcements that had already been made, like rewiring the nation, which I'll come, I can deal with in q and I'm not going to go through all the policies we've announced. That would take up too much time. I'm happy to answer questions about them and some of them will come up, EVs, new energy apprentices, rewiring the nation, community batteries, etc. We've already started announcing those, but we have much, much more to do. There's much more policy to come. 
And thirdly, and I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about this, um, that good climate policy is good jobs policy and the regions must be at the centre of that policy. And the reason I want to spend a bit of time talking about this is, as Kate said, I'm a former treasurer, I'm an economist by trade, um, and I think it's actually the key to changing the toxic politics in Australia. There's been a false debate for 20 years. The Conservatives arguing that, you know, you can have action on climate change, and but it comes at a cost to jobs and to growth and to investment. I just fundamentally reject that, that assumption and that proposition. In fact, I argue, and I think with some, you know, some evidence, that actually good climate policy is absolutely essential to strong economic growth, including in the regions. And this is why I think it's essential to winning the argument and frankly winning an election, that for too long, we've won the argument that action on climate change, by we, I mean progressives and the Labor Party and the left of centre politics, we've won the argument that action on climate change is a moral imperative. That argument is over. Um, you can't argue to the contrary. Um, uh, we, we, that, is, that is, I think, a given. But we keep losing elections because we've lost the argument that acting on climate change is in our country's best interest. We can't just argue that this is the right thing to do for the planet, but comes at some cost to us. We have to point out that actually acting on climate change is good for Australia and primarily good for Australia economically. Uh, primarily, it's the case that um, uh, acting on climate change creates economic growth. And it's a false narrative to say it comes at the cost of jobs, including those in the regions. We know that every dollar invested in renewable energy creates three times more jobs than a, a dollar of investment in old energy. And we know that uh, we can um, ensure that those jobs happen in the regions. And this is why, why it's important to focus on the regions, because a lot of people say, oh, don't worry about the regions. You know, um, they will never accept the science of climate change. I fundamentally reject that. The regions have positive, optimistic future with Australia as a 100% renewable economy. And then beyond that, a 200, 300, 400, 700 percent renewable economy as we become a renewable energy powerhouse and exporting nation. We will continue to export energy and be a net exporter of energy. Uh, in fact, even more so at the moment, we export a lot of coal and gas, but we import a lot of oil. As we move to electric vehicles, we'll import less oil, but we can export renewable energy. But the point is that that energy will, will be created in the regions. It won't be created in Jagger Jagger um, by and large or in McMahon, although you know, plenty will be on our roofs. But by and large, the places we will generate the huge amounts of energy we need are Gippsland, Latrobe Valley, Hunter Valley, Central Queensland, North Queensland. Why? Because you've got space for the big renewable installations, which you need, big solar and wind installations. They're the areas with the access to the ports, to the pipelines, to the grid, to the to the uh, railway lines to export energy through hydrogen, through pumped hydro, through um, uh, cables uh, to Southeast Asia. So it's the regions that will be at the centre point of that, centre of that. And that's the false argument that the other side runs. And we see it every day and it makes my blood boil. I say, oh, you know, climate change is an inner city obsession. Only people in the inner city, Melbourne and Sydney care about it. It's not true. People in the regions care about it and people in the regions will pay a price for inaction. We know that farm productivity is already down, that the drought, um, which is extended through Australia for so long, is related to climate change. We know that um, farm produce is down. We know that regions will uh, are, mainly, uh, are mainly those subject to natural disasters like bushfires uh, and floods and cyclones. Um, they are the ones who will pay the price, but they are also the beneficiaries of strong action. So let us reject, reject this false argument, this toxic identity politics that they engage in. Um, and have a, a good, strong, positive argument. And I'll just finish on this, Kate, before we take questions, that I mentioned before that we can be a 100% renewable economy. I think we can do much better than that. Um, we can be an exporter. Let me just give you two examples of the potential. Um, one is Sun Cable. This was in the news this week. Uh, th this is a really exciting project. Um, this is one solar farm in the Northern Territory, which will have 24 million solar panels. Um, it will export energy to Singapore, which can't, generate enough renewable energy because it doesn't have the space. It will do so through a submarine cable, through Indonesia and into Singapore. I mean, just imagine um, the export potential of that one project. Another is the Asian Renew Re Renewable Energy Hub, which will be in the Pilbara, which um, will primarily power the mines. Um, all the Pilbara's mines will be powered by renewable energy. We'll continue to be a very strong mining nation. I know some people don't like mining. I, I, I think we'll be continue to be a very strong mining nation mining the rare earths and minerals necessary for batteries and other things. Um, 
but all the mines will be powered by renewable energy. And then they'll have energy left over to export to Indonesia on hydrogen, hydrogen canisters on ships. And they're building a town in the Pilbara. They will build a town in the Pilbara that will house 8,000 people. That's how big this project is. And so uh, imagine the jobs that will be created. That's just two projects. There's many other opportunities. I haven't even talked about offshore wind. Maybe that'll come up in Q&A. That's job rich, energy rich, and a great story for Australia. So none of this implies any less ambition. Uh, on the contrary, um, we'll go to the election with a very ambitious climate change policy. The country needs it. The, the, the country deserves it. And we as the alternative government will provide it. Much more detail to come. But I do um, want to leave you with the thought that we change the way we mount the case for this change. We want to give people a bright, optimistic future of a renewable economy under a Labor government. The world's climate emergency, and there is one, and a nature emergency, is also Australia's jobs opportunity. And we have to seize that opportunity. We can turn around the toxic politics of the last 15 years, which Australia has engaged in. Other countries haven't done it. The United Kingdom doesn't engage in this toxic identity politics on, United, on um, climate change. The three parties have pretty similar policies and they're all much, much more ambitious than Australia's. But we can break that, we, we, but we break it with that strong economic positive message about Australia having a bright future as a renewable energy powerhouse. So really looking forward to your questions tonight. Thank you, Chris, um, for that opening, for the passion uh, and, you know, and for framing that in the um, optimism and the ambition for what we should be doing for this country and what our future should uh, look like. And the fact, obviously, that you tackled head on um, just that false argument that we get from the other side all the time, uh, that uh, people in the regions don't care about climate change and that, in fact, their uh, jobs will go on as is at the moment if we don't act. So. It's really good to also hear you um, tackling that head on. Um, there are a lot of questions already, so I will start with what we've got in the Q&A box. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, a quick and easy one to start you off, Chris. Gary asks, have you read all those books? <laughs> well, I've read most of them, yes. Um, so this is my home study. Um, I'll give you a little, that's, uh, that's the Australian history section. How many of them have you written? Uh, only a very small slither. That's the international right. section over there and Australian history there and the fiction room is outside. So um, um, uh, this is my little uh, nook in here where, uh, where I come and write my policies. <laughs> it is very impressive and I'm quite jealous of your book collection there. So thanks uh, for that question to start us off. Um, Don asks, considering that we've now got data available that emissions only fell during the Gillard government carbon price period, is this something that Labor, this information, is that something that Labor would use during the election campaign? Um, yeah, and um, I put a video out about this a few weeks ago, actually, about, you know, the government's claims that emissions have fallen 20%. Um, and, you know, really, uh, that's down to a few reasons. It's, it's true, but it's only down to a few reasons. Um, including uh, the Gillard, the Rudd Gillard period, the renewable energy target, um, and some of it from the carbon price at the time, uh, land clearing uh, reforms, um, and then anything since then has, and then emissions went up, of course, uh, for a period, and then anything since then is really been to, due to the recession, the COVID recession. So, and that's not anything that I don't think any government would want, really want to be claiming credit for. There's absolutely no policy that this government can point to. Uh, in which they can claim any credit for uh, a reduction in emissions. And, you know, we have pointed that out and we'll continue to point that out. Great. Uh, Daryl asks, will Labor support all workers in the coal industry as change evolves over the next decade? Yeah, and I think, um, I hope I've, you know, reflected how passionate I am and we are about support for the regions. But I, I, I want to just put a slightly different frame on, I think, it was, was it Daryl's question? Daryl, right, yeah. A slightly different frame to Daryl because a very common question and I understand where Daryl's coming from and yes change is coming and you know I said that in my first you know interviews when I took this portfolio with Lee Sales change is coming we can be honest about it or dishonest about it if we want but we should be honest about it and say to coal communities we value your work we respect your work it is good work it is you know has powered Australia for so long but change is coming the world is decarbonizing and those decisions are being made in the boardrooms of Beijing and Tokyo and Seoul and Berlin and where there's going to be less demand for Australian coal, and we, we should help you through that. But also, I actually think 
you know, when, when some people hear that and, you know, then Matt Canavan and George Christensen say, see, I told you Labor was coming for your job when we, were, when we were being honest about it. But that's why I frame it in a more positive way. I want these communities to have choices. I want individuals in the community to have choices going forward about working in renewable energy, working in renewable energy manufacturing, which is key. I didn't really touch on it in my opening remarks, but, you know, we have great opportunities in Australia. Uh, uh, one, one factoid. You know, in the last 10 years, we've put 60 million solar panels on our roofs in Australia. In the next 10 years, we're going to put many, many more than 60 million on. But 1% of those have been made in Australia. Now, it's just unthinkable that we continue to do that. We, we, we'd be make, we, we must make more of them in Australia. And again, it'll be in the regions. And that'll give people, that people in the regions a more diverse economy and more choices about where they and their kids work. The people who I talk to, and again, I make no apologies for when it's legal for me to leave my LGA, for going into the regions and talking to coal-fired power station workers. They deserve our respect and they deserve our honesty. Um, and as I say to the workers in the coal-fired power stations, it's my job to win the argument with you. I can go and do an, an environmental forum and win the argument. I'm going to win it with you because you've got your jobs at stake here. And, you know, I said that at the Yalorn Power Station, which is in Victoria and Gippsland, which has been announced to close, and said to them, You're, you guys are the ones who will lose your jobs, so I have to win the argument with you. And they say to me, yes, we know. We know that the world is changing. Not one person has ever argued to me in those regions, you know, in a coal-fired power station that I visited, oh, can we have another coal-fired power station to replace this one? They know that's not feasible but they want a plan about diversification and the change. And so that's why I put it in a positive frame that these regions by, by definition are the regions that will have the jobs of the future because that's where the renewable energy installations and the big renewable energy manufacturing facilities and the big transmission line upgrades, which we haven't talked about, but I can, that's where it'll occur and create the jobs. Mm. Um, Chris, the next two questions are, are really actually good follows on to that and related, so I'll ask you the two at, at once. Janice um, says that given both the German and Spanish governments were able to negotiate with their coal mining unions to transition out of coal, why doesn't Labor Party look to include those kind of policies into the mix? And likewise, Jenny says, uh, thanks, I'm hoping that we put forward a policy for the creation of jobs and retraining in clean energy anything you can say about that. So I guess about what Labor's policies in that space will be building on what you've just given us. Yeah, and, and look, as I said, um, that's really at the centre of our policy. Um, I, try, I prefer to, to put it in the positive rather than transition and your job's going and we'll retrain you. That's important. But again, the workers at your lawn said to me, we're happy to be retrained. And the other workers in other coal-fired power stations have said very similar. We're happy to be retrained, but we want to know there's going to be a job at the end of it. You know, and just going to go through the process of retraining. I think that's a very legitimate demand on their behalf. So there's all sorts of policies that we can and will engage in um, to assist those industries. The people who work in energy want to continue to work in energy, in my experience. You know, they don't want to work in a cafe and they don't want to, you know, work in a graphic design shop. They're good at making energy. But the good news is the skills that you need in traditional in energy, whether it be gas-fired power or coal-fired power or, or whatever, are, the, are very similar to the skills that you might need in a hydrogen plant um, or in uh, you know, running um, a big renewable energy and, and, and storage operation. And we haven't even really talked about storage. There are massive job opportunities in storage as well. And you know, I might just take a minute to talk about storage because it is a key part of the economic story. We're going to need to store our energy because, you know, again, our opponents say, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, which is about as sensible as saying the rain doesn't always fall, so we shouldn't drink water. Well, we store water and we can store renewable energy. But those dams in which we store water created a lot of jobs when they were built. And just, just as the storage capacity, whether it's building big batteries or building pumped hydro or building big hydrogen plants, and hydrogen is ultimately a storage mechanism, will create jobs and investment. Again, where are these things mainly going to be? In the Hunter Valley, in Gippsland, in the Latrobe Valley, in central Queensland. That's the story we'll take the election. And as you said, um, I do think, Chris, it's a, it's a powerful story. And um, it's a powerful story here in Jagger Jagger as well as in those regions, I think. Um, Paul has a question that I think goes to some of that framing and what we've been talking about, about how difficult this conversation has been in this country. And Paul says, 
My father and many of his contemporaries are convinced that our country can only be powered by coal. It's immensely frustrating. What can I say to him to try and persuade him that green energy can meet our long-term needs? Well, I think, Paul, a couple of points. I think yeah, the, the point is that actually a lot of what are people like your, um, your father uh, might not uh, fully appreciate is that renewable energy is much cheaper than coal. The most expensive form of energy is nuclear, uh, then coal, then gas, then renewables. Um, and that's, you know, that's not, that hasn't always been the case. The cost of renewable energy has come down massively, um, but a lot of people have yet um, to reach that conclusion. So we've got to sell that message again. If your father cares about energy costs, then he'll be pro-renewable. Um, also, again, a lot of people don't understand the storage question. You know, they say, well, yeah, again, as I said, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Well, that, that's true. That's when we have to have the message about storage. And again, we're seeing this complete misrepresentation by Barnaby Joyce of what's happening in Europe at the moment. And that's playing into those arguments. Um, again, yeah, sure. It's best to consider. Yeah, that's why we have to have storage. And there's a great storage task ahead of us um, uh, to build that storage. Uh, we need to have um, batteries, household, com uh, community, which we have a policy on, and grid. We need much more um, hydrogen in the system. It's only just starting at the moment. It's got a long way to go, but huge potential. And pumped hydro, which is basically a storage mechanism, pumping water up a hill, saving it for when um, we need it to let it out. And that's all powered by renewable energy, but that's a storage mechanism. We can and must do that. And we're going to need storage much, much greater than what we have at the moment. As we transition to, uh, away from coal and we'll transition away from gas, it's going to be a big effort um, to build that storage. But that's what people like your dad, um, you know, maybe haven't fully had explained to them that, yeah, we completely can see that it doesn't always, um, uh, wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. But that's not the point. We can deal with it. And it might not always blow in Melbourne uh, and it might not always blow in Sydney, but that's why we need a massive upgrade of the transmission lines, which is our rewiring the nation policy to get the renewable energy around the country for when it is not always windy in Sydney and not always sunny in Melbourne. We need massive upgrade uh, to those lines. And our rewiring the nation policy of $20 billion to upgrade the transmission grid. I know it's not the sexiest policy in the history of the world. You know, it's not on the front pages of the newspaper, but it's really important because there's no transition without transmission. Um, and we're not going to transition to a renewable economy unless we massively increase the transmission grid. Again, for your dad, there's going to be thousands of jobs created as we do that. So um, I hope we can, I hope some of those arguments might help convince him. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Rob's got one that's more of a comment, but I'll put it to you in case you do want to address it, which is um, Rob thinks it's time to bite the bullet and have some serious discussions with the Greens about amalgamation. Oh, dear. I almost start choking my uh, cup of tea <laughs> then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, um, I don't want to be sort of too, um, even though Kate and I are both uh, strong partisans and obviously true believers in the Labor cause, I don't want to be too disrespectful um, to the Greens. Um, other than to say this, you know, the Greens have a role to play in Australian politics and their role to play, as far as they're concerned, is to replace us as the party of the left. I don't accept that for one moment. Um, I believe we, we uh, close the ring. Um, we believe in economic growth and opportunity. They don't believe fundamentally in economic growth. Uh, I believe economic growth lifts people out of poverty and turns aspiration in reality. And it's why the Labor Party was created. It's a very different set of beliefs than what the Greens have. Um, and the Greens, you know, fair enough, they have a different values set to that. And that's you know, obviously I respect that. It's a different, uh, a different approach. But and, and more, perhaps more, more directly to do that, they believe in removing people like Kate and, you know, Josh Burns and Anthony Albanese and Tanya Plibersek from Parliament and replacing them with Greens. I don't see how that helps progressive Australia in the slightest, removing strong progressive voices uh, from Parliament. But that's their business model. And so they spend, you know, they, you know I, I represent a very different community. The Greens get about 3% of the vote where I live. Um, but so they don't spend any money trying to remove me from Parliament. They spend money trying to remove... Uh, people like Kate from Parliament and, and others, and I don't see how that helps. Um, but, you know, there are things we work with on the Greens, to be clear. You know, um, there are areas of, of agreement. So, you know, we, we successfully um, uh, moved the disallowance of the um, you know, change to ARENA to let it uh, invest, force it to invest in some fossil fuel technologies. Um, they've since 
the government has since tried again and you know we're moving the disallowance again and who knows whether it'll succeed but you know we i'm you know my office and um and adam band's office have a you know good relationship where we work together on those issues but then there's areas of a strong disagreement as well and there's areas where i will argue maybe some of them come up the greens policy perhaps well intention is completely unrealistic you know and not practical and not achievable and with respect that's okay for the greens because they're not going to form office when I'm writing a policy and talking to Kate about policies, I've got to know that, well, there's a 50-50 chance I'm going to be climate change minister where I have to implement these policies, so they've got to work. The Greens don't have that, that constraint. They can say, we can do this and this and this and this, and it's all going to be wonderful. It can all happen tomorrow, and they're never going to be held to account because they never they know, realistically, they're not going to win the next election. You know, They are not going to be the minister for climate change. I am, if we win the election. So our policies have to be more practical and more, and more uh, you know, um, evidence-based. So there's a difference of approach. Yeah, Chris, look, um, I would just second a lot of that. It is a question I get a lot locally, and I really understand where people are coming from on that because people are passionate and believe um, so strongly that we do, you know, it is urgent that we get this action now. And as you say, there are absolutely points where uh, it's the role of us and the Greens to work together on bringing that pressure and bringing that policy change. But why aren't we in a formal coalition? Why can't we do it all together? Well, as you say, um, they're targeting our seats. Like that's where they see their growth is by taking us out. So it, it just doesn't work on that sense. And as you say, on a broader worldview, we do still have differences in how we see people being supported and lifted up. And I think it's really important that we do remind people as well that those are labour values and what we'll continue to be pushing. So um, thanks for that. Uh, next question is from uh, Will, who asks, Will and Elise, sorry, um, would inquiries on climate policy early in the new ALP government be likely? Inquiries? Mm. Um, well, uh, I'm not sure we'll need inquiries um, mm. because we'll have policies. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we will, as I said, we've already started announcing a lot of policies. Uh, which I haven't really talked about in a huge amount of detail because I don't want to bore you with you know, all the detail unless I get a specific question, but community batteries, electric vehicle tax cuts, um, green energy apprentices, rewiring the nation I've talked about a little bit, um, all pretty important policies and there's much, much more to go. I don't want to become you know, climate change and energy minister and, and you know, call a Royal Commission into energy policy and climate change policy or have an inquiry because we don't have time, frankly. You know, we have to act as a country. We're way behind. Um, you know, the IPCC report recently um, gave us two things, I think, urgency and uh, agency. So by that, I mean urgent, agency is we still have time to act. It's not too late. Some people, you know, um, use an excuse for action. Oh, it's all too late anyway. Uh, and um, urgency, which is only if we act very quickly. So, you know, we have three ter year terms in Australia. We don't have time to hold a 12 month inquiry and then, you know, maybe it takes a long time to get legislation through and before you through it, before you know it, we're the ne next election, we're gonna hit the ground running. So we'll have a climate change bill, um, which I'll introduce as climate change minister, which will commit us to net zero by 2050 and um, commit us uh, to, the, to the framework to get there. I mean, that'll be one of our first early actions on coming to office. We don't have time to hold an inquiry into that. We know what to do. You know, the country knows we need to act. Um, by and large, we understand the policies we need to embrace uh, and we need to get on with it as a nation. Absolutely. Um, we have 33 questions in the chat box. So what I'm going to try and do now, Chris, is theme up a couple of them for you so we can hopefully get through as many as possible, um, which does take us to some questions about specific technologies. Um, so I will group a couple of these together for you to go through. Um, first um, question broadly about, yes, uh, supporting specific technologies, including tidal, uh, hydrogen and pumped hydrogen, and also what Labor might do to support the uptake of electric vehicles. Okay, great. Well, I might deal with electric vehicles first, um, because we are, that is, this is, we will not get to net zero emissions without a massive uptake of electric vehicles. We are way, 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 way behind um, the eight ball. Um, electric vehicle sales in Australia are 0.7% on the last figures we have of car sales, 0.7. In um, Norway, it's 74%. Um, so that's the difference between last, becoming last and coming first. And there's a whole bunch of countries in the middle. Realistically, you know, we could very easily with better policies be at least 5% now, which is 
a, a lot better than 0 0.7 and, and better. So the policies we've announced so far are to cut the electric vehicle tax in two ways, um, to make uh, affordable electric vehicles, so anything below the luxury car tax threshold, um, tariff free, now that's 5% price reduction, which is about $2,000 off a, a $50,000 car, so, you know, worthwhile. Um, and then the other tax cut is the fringe benefits tax. So we will abolish fringe benefits tax for electric vehicles um, given by fleets, um, below, again, in that affordable uh, bracket. Now, that'll take $9,000 off the cost of an EV. So you add nine and two, $11,000 cost saving for, a, for a, a business, big or small, that's very substantial. And remember, 50% of our car sales in Australia are fleet. So um, that's going to, I think, drive a big change, but it's not enough. We're going to need to do more and you know, we'll announce more electric vehicle policy between now and the next election. We get, we get the dregs of, of the world's cars. You know, um, they, send, but they send us, the manufacturers send Australia because we have such weak policies, the biggest gas guzzling, most inefficient, most unhealthy um, uh, cars. And that, that just has to change. So um, our cost reduction policy is, is already out there, but we've got more to do. On the other two, um, hydrogen and remind me what the uh, other yeah, one the title to hydrogen including pumps hydrogen pump, and pump. tidal yeah okay oh title right um yeah. so hydrogen's got huge potential as i said before it's basically a storage mechanism now we went to the last election with a lot of great hydrogen policies um and some of which the government has sort of since adopted despite saying they, they were snake oil at the time but adopted them in a pretty half-hearted way so if we were in office, if we won the last election, we'd already have a hydrogen hub in Gladstone. It would all be already up and running. Um, they've now sort of committed to, to some of that, but they're way, way, way behind. So again, I haven't announced more hydrogen policy yet, but hydrogen will be part of our policy offering. Uh, it's got huge potential. It's basically, you know, you take the, the wind and the solar and you store it. Um, pumped hydro has potential. Um, it's a little trickier because pumped hydro has a lot of environmental approvals to go through. It's basically, you know, in some sense, it's building a dam. Um, so that doesn't, you know, work for every, everywhere. Um, Alan Finkel in his um, quarterly essay, which some of you will have read, said Australia has, I think it was 22,000 potential pumped hydro sites. We currently have three operational and we have 22,000 potential. Now, the vast majority of those 22,000 won't come to pass, but some will. Um, and that's got potential and is an important part of the storage uh, mechanism. Now, Tidal um, is interesting. I, I, I like Tidal sort of in theory. Um, I get it. You know, think, well, you know, on those waves creating a lot of power. But practically, um, it has been very hard to make them stack up in Australia. And when you consider and, and, and reflect on the fact we have the best solar resources in the world, you know, it's just we have more petajoules hitting our landmass than any other country, and we have better than average wind, um, in, and we haven't even tapped offshore wind yet. There's no offshore wind in, in Australia because it's currently illegal. Um, we'll change that if the government doesn't doesn't change it. They've announced they will change it under pressure by us from us. But there's massive opportunities for offshore wind. It's windier off the coast, and um, uh, you can have massive wind farms sort of 10 k's off the coast creating a lot of energy and a lot of jobs when we've got all that potential there's not many experts who say to me title's going to play a big role just being honest um with the, with the person who posed the question again theoretically i get it but when you consider just how easy the other options are with technologies we know and understand and have adopted in australia title is probably not going to play much of a role okay a question about solar then, uh, Chris. Don would like to know, uh, what about the woeful feed-in tariffs offered by power companies? Will Labor force these companies to maximise their feed-in tariffs to incentivise further rooftop solar? Well, I'm not sure that's the way to incentivise further rooftop solar. We have one in four um, uh, houses in Australia has rooftop solar. We need to get it much closer to, you know, four in four. It'll get... Probably getting it to two and four is relatively easy. That's that second half, which is more difficult when you consider stratas and apartments and rental properties, et cetera. Um, that gets harder. We certainly need more solar um, take up in Australia, but you know we already have the highest per capita 
penetration in the world by far. It's us and then daylight. No thanks to the federal government. It's um, a combination of the renewable energy target, which we put in office, in place when we're in office, and state incentives that are already in place. I understand and respect Don's question. Um, you know, I, I like, you know, obviously as an owner of solar installation on, on my roof, I, I like a strong uh, feed-in tariff as, next, as much as the next person. Um, but I'm not sure that's really the way to encourage more take-up. I think the bigger challenge, frankly, is um, tackling storage because one in four houses has solar panels, but one in 60 has a battery. And that means there's huge amounts of solar being pumped onto the grid at lunchtime uh, and none being pumped in at nighttime when we're drawing down. And that's really part of that transition challenge. And this is why storage, I've talked a lot about storage, that's why it's so important because we need to capture more of that uh, energy that's being pumped in at lunchtime and not being used and store it for the night. So hence our policy of community batteries, 400 community batteries across the country, which is like a, a battery the size of a car down at the local park where we can all, all of us who've got solar panels but don't have batteries can feed in um, and, and can feed out at night. Um, so that's really, I think, the sort of more challenging part of the, the process is building that storage capacity, including household batteries and community batteries, in addition to the big grid batteries, which we're seeing more and more of. Yeah, it's pretty exciting seeing some of those um, battery projects come online, isn't it? Uh, Chris, another big theme that's coming through in the chat is really um, about how Labor, I think, counters some of um, the arguments that the government puts. So Barbara puts it like this. You talk and make it exciting, it is. But then Morrison gets up and gives a three-word slogan which makes the voters laugh and it ruins the truly exciting message you've just delivered. How on earth do other parties counter the funny man's slogans? Well, I guess Kate and I would say, welcome to our world. Um, that's what we have to do every day. Um, and, you know, it, it is the case that a, a simple lie is easier to prosecute than a more complicated truth. You know, we've been talking for 43 minutes and I've had a great opportunity to talk to about our policies. And you know, I hope I've explained them, you know, as best I can and relatively well, but it's taken 43 minutes. And this is to people who are interested, who logged in you know the vast majority of people are out there frankly getting food on the table and yelling at their kids and you know worrying about who's who's picking up the, the dry cleaning tomorrow and all that sort of stuff so they're not coming on to a, a, an hour long zoom um and they're the people we've got to get through to with our message but you know that's our job to come up with the uh, not the slogans because we don't really do slogans but the ways of communicating what is a complicated message as quickly and as simply as we can um Barbara was the question, I think, wasn't it? Um, That's right. Barbara, I like to think of it like this. When I'm thinking about how to explain something, you know, I might have a complicated policy that we've written and it's really good and I know it stacks up, but I know that the other side can misrepresent it. I'll tell you what I do. I go through a process and I think, if I'm standing at Fairfield Station, which is my local train station on platform one, and there's a train coming in and I've got to yell out to somebody on the other side of the platform and explain what I'm doing to them before the... With the, what the policy is before the train comes in, what are the words I use to explain that? That concentrates my mind really quickly <laughs> to work out how I'm going to explain this policy. It's basically how you write a headline. You know, what's the, because I'm only, I'm only going to have these people's attention for a few seconds on the news at six o'clock on, you know, uh, if we happen to break through on social media, we've got their attention for a few seconds. And so we have to explain it as quickly and as crisply as possible. And sure, that's complicated. And sure, Morrison, you know, um, I don't like him one little bit. Um, and I don't have much respect for his um, for his policies, but I respect his ability as a politician. He's, he is formidable. We just have to be better, and not be better by um, you know being um, you know less ambitious, but by better by explaining it as best we can. And that's our job. But also, frankly, it's all of our. You know, we, if Kate and I come up with the messages, and you're obviously passionate about climate change, if you come onto this Zoom, you know. Um, we can all spread the message. You can retweet Kate. You can you can take our messages on Facebook and share them, and take the sort of key. What when we say something, you think, oh yeah, that makes sense. And that'll explain. That'll help me explain to my dad, who's pro coal. Um, you know that um, uh, these policies, uh, you know, are pretty good. So we can do this. You know, we won the two thousand and seven election. I mean, I was in Parliament then. You know, we won the two thousand and seven election with a good and strong, ambitious climate change policy. It's not impossible. Um, but it's hard. It is hard. 
but that's my job to give us the best opportunity in all of our jobs, um, if I could be so bold to say, to help us spread the word. Absolutely, Chris. And actually, one of the things I love about um, being a member for Jagger Jagger is that I think people here are passionate about this, but they're also really interested in having a respectful and engaged conversation about this. And I really appreciate um, the efforts that people go to, both with me, but I know through so many community groups and other forums to have these discussions and to take them as widely as possible. Uh, Bernard's questions about um, the need for targets uh, as soon as possible. So Bernard says, um, do you think that people understand that the problem is the accumulated greenhouse gas emissions that will take centuries to dissipate and that meeting zero isn't enough? The target should really be as soon as possible rather than by 2050. Yeah, Bernard, I mean, I think, um, as I said, um, uh, when I opened, I, I think that's you know essentially right that what counts is the, the total emissions between now and 2050. The, the beauty or the benefit or the necessity of net zero by 2050 is it's a framework, right? If you don't have that target, you're not going to achieve it. But this is where Bernard's right, I think. If it was technically possible, which is not, but let's just, for the sake of the argument, if it was technically possible to get to net zero by 2050 by starting in 2048, so we just keep emitting, 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 and then in 2048, we you know close down everything and just go 100% renewable in 2048 and do it all then. Would that be enough to arrest climate change? No, no, um, because we've emitted so much between now and then. So hence, I don't quite agree that we need to get to net zero before 2050. But what I do agree with is that we need to be reducing emissions massively now um, on the road to net zero. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So net zero is the end point. It's an important end point. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. What really counts is the strong roadmap between now and 2050, which is really where I do agree with Bernard. Um, and that's why I say 26 to 28 as a medium term target just doesn't cut the mustard. Absolutely. Um, and I know we've spoken about that uh, before, Chris. Um, I have 31 questions still to answer for us, Chris, and uh, 10 minutes left. So again, I'm going to try and both theme up some of these and also go to some of some issues that we haven't yet touched on. Uh, so we've got a question about the Great Barrier Reef and how the ALP would protect the reef. So, I mean, the problem is, of course, that the Great Barrier Reef um, is in danger of becoming the world's largest cemetery, a marine cemetery. Um, and that, you know, uh, that, that's the problem. Now, this, I, guess, I guess there's sort of two ways of tackling the Great Barrier Reef. There's sort of reef-specific policies, which are really hard in a, in a, in a, in a warming ocean. Now, reef-specific policies are uh, the purview of our friend and colleague, Terry Butler, who's the Shadow Minister of the Environment. So I'm the Shadow Minister of Climate Change. It's actually separate to the environment portfolio. Um, and she has... Um, you know, she has ideas and policies and, you know, maybe she could come on a Zoom one night, Kate, and talk about the environmental side of things. Absolutely. But really, but really, um, it comes down to meeting our, our um, Paris commitments and arresting climate change and holding it to 1.5. I mean, that's the key to the future of the Barrier Reef. But I guess it does come back to that point I made before about acting on climate change being in our national interest. Um, and... I can't think of you know many better examples. And if we lose the Barrier Reef, which is one of our icons, that's not in our national interest. So Australia has got to play our part in acting. Yeah. And yes, uh, very good point about Terry. Uh, you know, uh, very passionate in the environment side of it. And um, absolutely, I'm keen to get her here to Jagger Jagger, either in person if we get to that point or um, via Zoom. So thanks, Chris. Uh, David has asked if there's a view or policy that specifically addresses the expiry of the mandatory renewable energy target in 2030. Um, no, see, I don't, David, it's a good question, but I don't think um, we need to in that the renewable energy target was designed to encourage the take up of renewable energy when it was uneconomic, um, when, you know, renewable energy was just you know, really sort of taking off as a commercial proposition, but it was still expensive. Um, it's worked. It's one of the reasons why we have one in four solar panels on roofs, uh, you know, one in four houses with solar panels is the renewable energy target. Now that renewable energy costs have fallen so much, um, and it makes sense, it's economic sense for people to put panels on roofs now. Um, uh, I think we need a whole bunch of other policies about, and I take a sector by sector approach, so household energy, 
industrial energy, agriculture, transport, etc. And we've got a lot more policy to come. I don't think we need to um, have a you know a, a renewed RET and renewable energy target because it is such now power it is just so powerfully um, sensible for households and industry to take up renewable energy without the RET in place because it's done its job. Uh, a couple of questions about uh, again specific areas, Chris, uh, and in the interest of time, I might group them together as well. Uh, so Marguerite, keen to know um, about whether Labor would stop the development of the Adani coal mine. Uh, also a question from Bridget on Labor's stance on nuclear energy. And then from Paul on farming and uh, carbon ca capture in farming. Okay, I'll try and get through them quickly so we get similar as well. So it'll be a bit of a quick fire round. Um, nuclear energy, no, no role in a, under a Labor government. It's not economic. It's the most expensive form of new energy. That's before we even get to the risks, risks and the morality of the argument. Why would you go down the nuclear road when we have such powerful sun, solar and wind options? It's beyond me. So no, no, no on nuclear energy. On Adani, Adani um, is done. It's approved. The work is starting. Um, so, you know, there, there is no capacity now to rip, up, rip that up or, or stop it. Um, not everybody's going to love that answer, but... You know, I'm just going to be honest and say it's done. It is equivalent to 5% of Australia's coal exports. So, you know, it is, it is another coal mine. It's 5%, there's 95% that was already there. But, you know, that decision has been taken and it is, um, and it is done. Um, you know, we've got to reduce our own emissions um, and, and we've got to prepare our coal communities for the world's change. So that's, um, that's what we have to do. And remind me of the third one, Kate. Uh, the third one, Adani nuclear and um, carbon cap capture and storage from farming. Oh, oh well, yeah, and, and sequestration in farming. Yeah. yeah, so farming is about 11%, agriculture is about 11% of our emissions. Um, but the good news is that there's huge opportunities there. So um, actually your soil becomes more productive if you have carbon stored in it, you know, by, by various farming, because it's a, it's a rich nutrient. Um, so there's great opportunity there. And there's also great opportunities for Australia. Um, you know, Australian researchers and scientists have found this element in this particular type of seaweed. Um, again, which sounds really sexy, right? Um, but they found this particular element, in this particular type of seaweed, um, which I tell my kids is asparagus, but it's asparagopolis. Is this brief? Is this um, species of seaweed? But if you um, if you take it and put it in cattle feed, it reduces the amount of belching and methane emissions from cattle by you know, massive amounts, massive amounts, a little bit of this. So again, you know, Australia's leading the way. So my, my message is you hear all this debate from the National Party, oh, farmers can't pay the cost of that. Farmers have to be part of the solution because it's in their best interest. It's gonna help them a lot. Absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna put in one more question on a different topic and then I am gonna um, call an end because I know people have dinners to get to. I can hear my children screaming outside the door. I'm sure um, many of you are in a similar situation. So um, Chris, last question from Vera. How will a Labor government engage our First Nation people in transitioning to renewable energy in their communities? Um, well, uh, very importantly, um, and you know, I mean it when I opened the remarks tonight by acknowledging traditional owners and thanking them for their stewardship of the land. I mean, they, they, they know this land better than anybody um, and know how to manage it better than anyone. Um, and they want to be part of the process. And again, they have been. So, you know, I referred to that um, Sun Cable proposal before, um, 24 million solar panels and all the, it's on, it's on traditional land. Traditional owners are, um, you know, deeply in favour of it, um, uh, for example. So, we do need to engage with traditional owners across the board at all times about how we navigate these issues. And they have a very positive contribution to make and they, they care. They care more about the, the land because it's an important part of their culture than, um, you know, any other community on the planet. Absolutely. And again, in policies that we, we already have announced, Chris, we do have a policy to support the creation of more Indigenous rangers, um, which are so important and, and such a... Um, I know, um, you know, well uh, regarded job in so many of those communities where people are paid um, to care for country in a traditional way and it's had a real impact um, on our country. So that is also a policy that Labor will be taking to the election there.
Um, I am going to call an end to questions there. Thank you to everyone. Um, and I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but you know that I am always here um, for you to engage with. So you can absolutely um, you know, email me through any questions that you still feel you need answered. And I will do my best to both follow up with Chris uh, and to get you an answer. Uh, I will also um, do my best to provide more opportunities for um, people here in Jaga Jaga to keep engaging with us on climate change and climate change policy in the lead up to the election. As Chris and I have been saying, this is so important and it is so important to Labor and to all of our futures. So Chris, a big thank you um, from me to you for making the time tonight. I hope you can see from the discussion we've had um, how engaged people here are in this topic. Well, um, well, it's been um, a lot of fun for me, Kate, and you know I very much appreciate people's feedback and and ideas and input. I, I mean that very genuinely. I do a few of these, and you know the, it is very useful to me. And um, uh, thanks again to you, Kate, for putting this on. And I'll I'll finish uh, where I started and say what a valuable member of our team Kate is, and how much of an important contribution she makes in the caucus, and how much we needed to continue to be making that contribution. Thank you, Chris. Well, that's a lovely note for me to end on. Um, <laughs> thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I will let you all get to dinner and children again. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. Good night.